Who controls the internet? The short answer is, it's complicated. In a sense, no one does, and everyone does. Hey, this is Professor Grabowski, and the first thing to understand about internet governance is that it's not centrally governed. There isn't a single authority like the United Nations or a hypothetical internet police overseeing the global web. While there have been suggestions to establish such an entity, or for existing international bodies, such as the United Nations, to set universal internet policies, this idea remains unlikely. The world comprises almost 200 countries, each with its unique approach to how the internet should function and what content should be accessible, and that's influenced by their politics, their history, cultural differences, and economic factors. As a result, there are no standardized rules or policies governing the internet. Instead, a diverse array of entities plays a role in shaping internet regulation, including governments, tech companies, and internet users themselves. So let's unpack that a bit and look at the different actors that influence internet regulations. First, the internet's basic structure acts as a foundational level of regulation. Internet users are bound by the codes and applications of the internet, analogous to how people must adhere to physical laws in the real world. Various nonprofit organizations, such as the Internet Society, the Internet Architecture Board, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, and ICANN are responsible for developing this infrastructure. These groups define the protocols dictating how the internet is accessed and how data is transmitted and shared. They ensure that the internet remains an efficient, accessible, and standardized system for global communication and information exchange. National governments exert their influence once users are online. For instance, North Korea severely restricts internet access to a select few, like government officials and foreign diplomats. China employs a mix of tools and regulations to block specific content, leading to censorship of many Western websites and applications within its borders, a practice often referred to as the Great Firewall of China. In contrast, the United States experiences minimal government censorship, largely due to the First Amendment of its Constitution, which prohibits government interference in free speech. However, this freedom does have limits, and certain types of speech like child pornography or content threatening national security, are not protected and may be restricted. Tech companies also significantly influence internet governance. They generally fall into two categories, content providers and internet service providers, or ISPs. First, content providers encompass a broad spectrum, ranging from individual bloggers and small online storefronts to large-scale corporations like Google, Facebook, and Netflix. These entities are obligated to adhere to governmental regulations, yet they retain the autonomy to establish their own operational policies that may impose additional rules on internet users. This independence enables them to exert control over the content accessible on their platforms, including determining who can view their content. In certain instances, a platform may impose user bans for terms of service violations. Additionally, they possess the authority to limit content access based on geographical location. For instance, Netflix might exclusively hold the rights to broadcast the latest Tom Cruise movie in the United States, but not in Asian countries. Similarly, an e-commerce company might restrict Russian consumers from making purchases on their site, either due to logistical challenges, like an inability to deliver products to Russia, or in compliance with U.S. government-imposed trade restrictions with Russia. Meanwhile, internet service providers, like content providers, must adhere to government rules, but also have considerable leeway in setting their own policies. ISPs, such as AT&T and Verizon, can influence which websites are accessible, the speed of content delivery, and data usage. If you recall the big debate over network neutrality a few years ago, that's what that was all about. Should we let ISPs throttle traffic like that? Many colleges and businesses also function as their own internet service providers, 
and can restrict access to certain websites on their networks and impose sanctions for policy violations. For example, some schools have blocked access to porn websites, TikTok, or ChatGPT on their network. In summary, internet governance is influenced by a diverse range of entities, from nonprofits overseeing internet architecture to governments setting policies within their borders and tech companies determining the terms of use for their services. Consequently, the online experience of regular internet users is not uniform, but varies significantly based on their geographic location. The internet, as perceived and accessed, differs markedly from one country to another. Additionally, internet users themselves are pivotal in influencing internet policy, but the degree of their impact is heavily dependent on their geographic location. In nations where freedom of expression and digital rights are upheld, users wield considerable influence over internet regulations. However, in more restrictive societies, their ability to shape internet policy is very limited. In the United States, the landscape of internet policy is open to influence through several channels. Citizens have the power to shape this policy indirectly through elections, by consciously selecting their internet service providers, and by exerting market pressure on tech companies. This can be achieved by making informed decisions as consumers and, when necessary, pursuing legal action to hold these companies accountable. However, the emergence of monopolies among large tech corporations poses a challenge to the ideal of a free market, potentially curtailing competition and reducing the spectrum of choices available to users. Moreover, in the United States, individuals have increasingly turned to the legal system for recourse against major tech companies and the government. These legal challenges often revolve around issues of privacy infringement, inappropriate data sharing practices, and breaches of constitutional rights. While prevailing in such legal battles can be an uphill task for the average individual, there are instances where they succeed. These victories, albeit rare, can act as catalysts for significant changes in regulations, setting precedents that shape the future of internet governance and user rights. But it's crucial to understand that this internet freedom isn't universal. While the United States is ranked among the top nations for online freedom, in some corners of the world, the internet is a tool of control rather than liberation. In the end, the question of who controls the internet is akin to asking who controls the flow of a river. It's shaped by the landscape it flows through, altered by those who harness its waters, yet always moving, always evolving, a testament to the collective forces that shape this digital odyssey. However, akin to the metaphorical river, the internet weaves its way across the grove. However, Akin to that metaphorical river, the internet weaves its way across the globe, which raises a pivotal issue. What happens when a user in one nation finds themselves embroiled in a digital dispute with another user across international borders, particularly when their home country's laws are in conflict? We will delve deeper into this complex issue in my upcoming video lecture focused on the international conflicts of internet law. Well, I'm Professor Grabowski, and thank you for watching.